I've been thinking for quite a few years now about doing some family history research as an academic project. I don't have a clear memory of how long ago this idea started germinating, but I think between five and ten years ago. One of the early prompts for it was a conversation, or maybe a series of conversations, between Deb and I about our respective ancestors, so it's actually very appropriate to have Deb chairing this session. And actually I think the idea that I do a seminar on this topic was actually her suggestion as well, so doubly appropriate I guess that she's chairing. I guess an early seed for the idea would have been when I was asked back in 2007 to present a paper at a fabulous conference organised by a group of young Asian New Zealand activists in Wellington. The conference was called Sweet As, Ethnic and Pākehā New Zealanders Talk Ethnicity and Dominance in a Colonised Land, and I was asked to talk about Pākehā. I called my paper, paper Becoming Pākehā, Dominance and Its Costs, and began the paper with this introduction to my own Pākehā identity. I'm just going to read the bit from the, um, from the paper that I gave back then. I don't know much about my ancestors. There have been really very few stories passed down through the family, just a few names, dates and facts. I don't know why any of my ancestors came here, but I know when some of them arrived. The earliest I know about is my mother's great-grandfather, who was apparently at the signing of the treaty as one of the British Royal Engineers present at the occasion. I know he was there because I read it in a book. It's not something I've ever heard mentioned in the family. I've also read in books that, quote, he was a warm friend and sympathiser with the Māori race, and was opposed to the Māori war and to the policy which involved the confiscation of their land, unquote. Was apparently influential in getting Wiramu Tamihana to agree to a peace after the invasion of the Waikato, and was for a time an MP. I don't remember hearing any of this spoken of in my family. He eventually returned to England and died there, but left behind a number of children whose families for generations lived in the Auckland region. On my father's side, both his paternal grandparents landed in Christchurch from Northern Ireland in the 1860s. They met, married and farmed in Canterbury before a depression in the late 1800s drove them off the land penniless with nine children and they moved to Taranaki. There they, quote, took up Māori leasehold land at Pūnuho, no capital required, unquote, as the family history records it, or not so much a family history as an annotated family tree of the Bells in New Zealand. I'm not sure if anyone in the family other than me has ever stopped to think about what that sentence says. This economic opportunity to take up free capital, i.e. land, allowed our grandfather and his brothers and sisters to grow up healthy, if not wealthy, at the direct cost of the dispossession and impoverishment of Taranaki iwi. Again, although the facts are there in this case, I've never heard anyone in the family mull this over or reflect on what this says about our family's direct relationship to colonisation in this country. So that's the extract from um, the talk I gave back in 2007 at the Sweet As conference. And it's clear from that that at that time I, w I was thinking about the direct relationship of my family to colonisation, but I was also thinking about the fact that we, many of us anyway, don't know these stories, we don't discuss them within our families, we don't pass them down, we don't use them to reflect on our relationship to the colonisation of Aotearoa and the dispossession of Māori. So the idea of exploring this issue of my family's relationship to the colonisation of New Zealand kept percolating away in my brain as something I'd love to do while I was busy doing other things, finishing writing my book and other papers of course, um, as well as moving jobs and cities and so on. Then in 2012 Esther Fitzpatrick, who is also here today, asked me to be a participant in her PhD research, which was to be a series of duo ethnographies about Pākehā educators and how being Pākehā influences our practices as educators. As with a lot of PhDs, I think Esther's project has morphed in focus along the way since then, and certainly what transpired in my interviews with Esther was that we ended up exploring the stories of our ancestors in Auckland. We both had ancestors who were here in the early days of colonial settlement. Esther has extensive background in family history research, so I learnt more about George Graham during this project, that it's really been the springboard for finally embarking on my own research. So this year I finally began doing some family history research of my own, and I decided to tackle one ancestor or family at a time, and began with George, the first of my ancestors to arrive, and the one who was the least ordinary in a sense. He was a public figure in early New Zealand and in Auckland in a small way, so there is some kind of reasonable archival record about him which makes him kind of easy to research in that sense. 
So what initially drew me to this work, what I want to talk about in this session, in this talk, is I want to talk about what interests me about um, this kind of research, what I've learned since I got started about what's interesting about it, um, and some of the uh, reasons why you might not do it or the, some of the challenges involved in doing it. Um, so starting off with what I was initially interested in, some of the reasons are personal. I mean, I have a long-standing interest in family history and in history more generally. History was my favourite subject at school, uh, and I know I've got in my files at home, I've got little hand-drawn family trees that I I wrote when I was a teenager, maybe, or a kid, um, talking to my parents and giving them to give me the names of family members as far back as they could remember. And I also recorded conversations about his life with my father before he died. And so I've always had this kind of historical interest and family history interest. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's probably fair to say that my all my academic work over the last 20 years has been oriented towards considering the role of colonial history in shaping Pākehā identities in, in the present and in shaping Māori and Pākehā relations. So there is a strong kind of personal interest there. There's also another personal aspect to this in terms of the stage of career. And then I think I don't really have that many more uh, research projects in me. Uh, and it, it was sort of um, a matter of thinking about a research project that was likely to give me the maximum pleasure and enjoyment at this stage of my um, academic career. So those are really my personal motivations. But there's obviously academic ones as well. Those are not good enough on their own. Um, there is the classical sociological interest in linking the personal to the public, to understanding ourselves in relation to wider public issues. This is something that American sociologist of education, Christine Sleater, now an emeritus professor, um, has done work on through her own study of her family's connection to slavery and colonisation. So just this kind of classic sociological, very C. Wright Mills kind of um, thing about using pub private stories in this case, to connect to wider public issues. Um, a similar, I guess, related uh, interest is that I, I'm interested in countering that old time-worn story that we need to move on, we need to forget about the past, it's over, it's nothing to do with us, we aren't the people who stole Māori land, etc. The view that Margie Weatherall, who is also here today, um, many years ago, very helpfully called The Discontinuous View of History in that great book that she and Jonathan Potter wrote, uh, Mapping the Language of Racism. So I think that's a very helpful kind of concept, the discontinuous, that kind of idea of a discontinuous view of history that somehow history is sort of cut off, there's some sharp break between us and history. Um, so it's nothing to do with us. I've tried to counter that view in various ways in my work, and this is another means to counter those kinds of arguments by tracing the direct connections between my family and the story of colonisation in the communities that they lived in, and hopefully in a way that can prompt other people to think about um, their own ancestry and their own family stories. Um, I also have as a motivation a desire to work against the liberal narrative of progress, the whole idea we often commonsensically have anyway, uh, that they, back in those days, the old colonisers were, um, they were unenlightened, they were racist, they were, you know, bad people in some way, and that we know better now. We're not, we're not racist like that now, we know much better. I'm interested in exploring the ways in which our ancestors are really not that different from us. They were real people, not ogres by and large anyway. They often had good intentions or mixed intentions. And a lot of what they did or condoned was driven by self-interest or research or group interest, not that different from today, I don't think. In a recent conversation with Laura Ishiguro, who's an historian of imperial families, she said she's interested in how was it livable to be a settler coloniser. I think this is a great question and one that I'm very much interested in. How did they, from where we stand today, it's in, stunning to imagine how they could feel justified and moving into someone else's country and taking over, and often, anyway, thinking that they were doing good at the same time. And we know quite a lot about how they managed that trick at the high abstract level of discourses of race hierarchies and hierarchies of civilization, not to mention the Christian mission of saving souls. But how did that play out in their day-to-day -day lives and interaction with real indigenous people that they came to know and live alongside? How like and how different from it uh, was it, sorry, 
from how we find our own lives livable today in the face of hugely unjust inequalities in the towns and cities that we live in and in the wider world and all the um, things that we know about inequality and injustice across that world. So those were my um, initial motivations um, in embarking on this. And I've learnt, I've, I've only just started on this project in the last few months, but I've already learnt a few more um, things that I think is sort of point to the value of this kind of work for me. One is the power of the particular or the concrete. Um, and just as an example of that, uh, I went to Windsor while I was in England. George Graham was born in Windsor. And just, and I don't know if anybody here has been to Windsor, or Margie will have been there, I don't know about anybody else. Um, but when you go to Windsor, you, you, what's striking about it is that this is this little town that's nestled at the base of Windsor Castle, this massive wall that looms over the town. Um, it's also the home of the Coldstream Guards. If you walk around the town and in the area near the castle, there's this you know, very large, um, obvious army barracks. So, you know, and it's always been that kind of a military and a, and a royal town, clearly. So that made me think about George growing up there in the 1800s and how in that context, service to the British Crown, particularly in connection with the military, would have been an obvious avenue to pursue if you were an aspiring young man, some kind of middle class man. His um, his father was a wine merchant at some point anyway, so I think they were probably, you know, I don't know if they would be called middle class, but something, something like that, I guess. Um, another little kind of concrete detail, George wrote a letter to one of his sons towards the end of his life. His son had obviously asked him to give him some family history stories. Um, and he wrote about, in that letter, he, one of the things he mentioned was how his uncle uh, had been press, one of his uncles anyway, had been press ganged into the military and been killed at the storming of Serangapatam in India. So, and I was struck by that, and it, it was a sort of a powerful reminder of the power of the state over the individual that you could be, you know, just taken up, picked up off the street and uh, forced into the military, into military service and potentially lose your life in that kind of way. Um, I don't know how different that really is from conscription and the present conscription systems. I think it probably is a little bit different. So it was. It made me think about how families had to look after themselves, how they had to make their own ways in the world back in those eras, in that era before there was a welfare state. So I, I kind of, when I think about those things, I think, you know, no wonder they were very enterprising. Um, I've also been very much aware of or become very much aware of the power of spatial stories or stories of place. I know a few times recently I've, I've said in various contexts you know, how I've fallen in love with place and theories of place. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very, I find very excited by, and this connects to the first point there too really about the particular and the concrete, you know, the local. Um, and here I'll get to why I've used the image of a tree on my slides and bring us to Auckland and to New Zealand. I'm about to start work on my first piece of writing out of this research, and I can use uh, some of that to illustrate this point. I've already mentioned that George came here with the Royal Engineers in 1840 at the very founding moment of Auckland. Oops, sorry, I forgot this piece of uh, quote, this lovely quote from Tim Ingold that should have come up with the last point about spatial stories. Every place is a gathering of things, is a knot of stories. Just a, a very nice image, I think, about place and story. Um, back to George and Royal Engineers and Auckland. In his capacity of um, with the Royal Engineers, George was in charge of the design and building of the military barracks Two in the city, one at Point Britomar, which is approximately where Emily Place, etc. is now. I don't know if I can make a pointer at the top of the screen there, where the um, trees are. Um, I think would kind of be, would have been a headland back in those days. There would have been water below that. The land below that now has been reclaimed. Um, so I think that's probably where Point Britomart was, named after HMS Britomart, which surveyed the Waitamata in 1841. And the other barracks was Albert Barracks, named after Queen Victoria's Prince. 
Esther found an obituary of George printed in the New Zealand Herald when he died in 1901, and that blows me away in itself, actually, that he was here in 1840 and he didn't die until the 20th century. And it makes that sort of history of his life kind of feel very present to me, even though that's over 100 years ago now, I realise. Um, anyway, in this obituary, George is credited with the idea that the barracks land could one day become a park for the city, the present-day Albert Park. So that, um, I knew from earlier history gathering many years ago that he was involved in the building of the barracks at what is now Albert Park, but had never heard before that the park might have been his idea. So that was very exciting and a source of some pride for me. Um, there's the park in the middle of our photo there, that aerial shot. I love Albert Park, uh, as do many others. Such a beautiful green space between the CBD and the university. And yes, um, these are imported trees, uh, part of the ecological imperialism that was part of the wider imperial project. And we know a lot of the downside of that um, ecological imperialism, rabbits, gorse, and so on. But I love them even so. I love deciduous trees, um, and I love these trees in particular. And, I, and thanks to Neil Challenger in the seminar last month uh, for referring to these very trees and how they have in turn been colonised by native epiphytes, so that they have become incorporated into a shared cultural landscape, which was what the topic of, of Neil's talk was last month. So, okay, so there's also, um, here's just another slide of, I uh, found this plan of um, the original Albert Barracks, and the only remaining remnant of that is this little bit of Barracks wall, which runs next to the library in the university, so this section of wall. Uh, between Alfred Street and Prince's Street on the map that's still in existence. The rest of it was pulled down when the park was created in, I think, the 1870s. I've since found more tree stories related to George as well, uh, including that he gave acorns to Governor Hobson to plant in the government house grounds. And I read a little bit uh, just today when I was getting ready for this talk uh, on the website of the UK Woodland Trust, I thought I'd look up what on earth, what the symbolism of the oak tree might be, and discovered that um, the oak tree, is, particularly in English history, has long been associated with um, religious practice, but also more immediately with royalty. And according to the, U the Woodland Trust, it is a national symbol of strength and survival. And I'm sure these kind of royal connotations and very much British connotations would have been um, relevant to the choice of oak trees to grow at Governor House grounds. There are still lines of oak that circle what we now call Old Government House and which is part of our university campus, but I haven't yet done the research to see if I can find out if they are these very same oaks from George's acorns. But that is one of them at the side of um, my slides that I've been um, showing. In, in this presentation. So these trees and tree stories, trees that by fluke are present in my weekly working life since I moved back to Auckland, feel like very concrete connections to George and ones that give me a lot of pleasure in many ways. And knowing these stories now, I can never walk through the old government house grounds or through Albert Park without also being reminded of the colonising project that gave us these places, that transformed them into what they are now. And of course this is true of every inch of this country that we travel over and live on, maybe apart from a few truly untouched areas like down at the bottom of Fjordland or something. They are all as they are today as a result of this colonising project, but we mostly forget about this in our daily lives. And just kind of um, a sobering, I guess, aspect that brought this home to me um, when I was doing my archival research in the UK. I visited the National Archives at Kew to look at various engineering drawings of George's that are lodged there. I nearly didn't go because I'm not that interested in engineering actually. Um, I didn't really think they would tell me anything particularly interesting about George's life, but I was encouraged. I had a conversation with Alan Lester, who's a professor of geography at Sussex University, while I was over there and he really encouraged me to go. He said, you never know what you might find. And of course, I was glad that I did. There are largely plans of buildings, barracks for soldiers, unsurprisingly, 
um, all around the North Island, Auckland, Whanganui, Wellington, and sketches of various landscapes around the North Island, Whanganui, New Plymouth. And there was another little frisson of connection for me around these sketches. Um, I have no artistic skills, but I, to see that he could draw made me think about my artistic and creative cousins and how what they may have inherited from George, um, whatever inheritance means or however it works, you know, is the mystery. Um, but there were some in particular of the drawings that I saw um, that were really a sobering reminder to me that even though George didn't pick up a gun or go out to subdue the natives, his work was intimately tied to their enterprise. Uh, that he bought, he, he uh, designed and oversaw the building of, of buildings to house soldiers, but also a gunboat raft, um, buildings to hold munitions, and so on. And just seeing these, I think, made, um, this goes back to the point about the concrete in the particular, I guess, really brought home to me what it was that his work was about. No matter what he did in helping make peace in the Waikato or arguing against the confiscation of Waikato lands or anything else he did that supported Māori interests in any way, he was also inextricably part of the enterprise that stripped Māori of their lands and established settler rule. He bought great hunks of Auckland himself in the early days and retired reasonably wealthy, I think. He was an imperial careerist and personally did very well out of it. So learning about these stories brings the concrete practices of colonial government and colonial violence to me, to here and now, in a much more immediate way than reading a national history of colonisation which might talk about, you know, land confiscations after the wars or about the work of the Māori Land Court or whatever, at a fairly high abstract level. It doesn't have the same impact on me as thinking about these specific and very concrete stories. Um... Another aspect of what I've learned since is um, that you never know what you'll find. You find new mysteries and new revelations as you start getting underway with uh, historical, genealogical kind of research. Um, and there's been a number of things that, that have come up for me, but one I thought I'd mention here was the kind of unexpected lines of thought that develop. And one for me has, has been this question, or is still, it will be a question I'll ponder for a long time, I imagine. What is the nature of inheritance? When I was talking to Alan Lester, he said our ancestors are as much strangers to us as anyone, um, which is absolutely true. You know, we don't know them, we never met them, they lived in a different time and place and so on. Uh, but they are also viscerally, if that's the right word, connected to us. Um, they are in our DNA, whatever that means. Without their existence, we would not exist. So we are indebted to them, in a sense, for our very lives. And in addition to that, their lives created the context for the generation to follow and then the generation after that and on down until we get to us. Hence the idea that we inherit a debt from them, um, I think is a very real one. And it's that the settler colonial debt in particular that I am interested in. Okay, so what about some arguments against doing this kind of research? What are the dangers or the, uh, the challenges that are involved? Um, one argument against is that it, there is more important, more immediate work that needs to be done, working as allies with uh, Indigenous people and the ongo and work against colonisation in the present, working directly towards uh, decolonisation. And I guess I would agree that, yes, that is hugely important work, um, but I'm also very aware that it's only a small proportion of white settler people who take up work as allies, and that the vast majority don't. And I think that vast majority are still not unimportant, if you like. Um, if decolonisation is ever to kind of really get a lot of traction, we need more people from the, uh, the white or the settler side of the equation who are on board with that kind of programme, if, if you like. And so... I think there's still a need for educative projects that aim to encourage settler peoples to see themselves in relation to colonisation. And my hope is that personal stories and stories of local and particular places may help shift people and help them develop that awareness of being historically embedded in this colonial legacy. Another argument against doing this kind of work is here you go again, focusing on white people. Um, Sarah, and I've been reading, rereading Sarah Ahmed's uh, critical piece on whiteness studies, 
and there uh, and taken a few points from from what she argues there one thing she says there is that um declarations of white guilt or white racism are very quickly followed by good feeling that you know by declaring your your badness in the past or your ancestors badness that offers us a sense of redemption we move on to feeling better about ourselves um another line of criticism this is not really so much from ahmed's piece uh uh, is that focusing on white people continues to keep them at the centre of our stories about history rather than decentering the white subjects of colonialism. And another point from Ahmed, which really kind of struck home for me, she says we, she comments on our use of the word critical, and I think she really is talking about herself here as well as, as others of us. She says that critical is the place where we deposit our anxieties when we use a term like critical whiteness studies, she says that signifies an anxious whiteness. And, you know, I've used the word critical settler family in critical settler family history. And again, she would say, and I think I agree with her, that that signifies a sort of an anxious uh, settler subject, if you like. She says we might think that our use of the word critical can protect us from doing the wrong kind of whiteness studies or settler family history. But the word critical, she says, does not mean the elimination of risk. These are very useful warnings for me or for anyone who embarks on this kind of research to think about. So in response to, to these um, criticisms or potential problems, um, there's a few things that I think are useful to think about in terms of framing this kind of project. One is I want to write about the past, not to transcend it, not to be redeemed by it, uh, redeemed from it, if you like, in some way, but to know my origins more precisely, to explore the relationships of my families to the colonial story and to reflect on how they sh that shaped their becoming uh, New Zealand, or our becoming New Zealanders or our becoming Pākehā. I want to face my ancestors and learn from them, to understand myself as their descendant and inheritor of their privileges and their debts. And I want to understand my own, more fully my own embeddedness in the colonial story. Secondly, there are also the wider public stories of their places and times. So to make sense of my ancestors' histories, I need to situate them in the context of the communities that they lived within and the politics and economics of those communities. And in our New Zealand context, of course, I want um, particularly interested in in the situation of iwi and relationships with iwi in their communities at the time. Victoria Freeman, in her fantastic book on her settler family ancestors in North America, talks about the challenge of bringing her ancestors and Aboriginal people into the same narrative universe. And here she was talking particularly about the fact that most of the written history is settler history, uh, or else it's filtered through settler eyes. It was the settlers who, who wrote in the early eras in, partic in, in particular. And so everything was written down with their, you know, interpretation. So writing, bringing these two narrative universes together, or these two narrative strands together, is one small guard against centering the white settler subject of history. These subjects that I'm interested in are subjects enmeshed in complex relations, and it's really those relations to others and their time and place that is most interesting, rather than the individuals themselves. There's also the challenge of writing the particular and the familial in ways that will connect with others. Uh, and I've quoted Freeman again there, and just to give the longer quote that, she, that I've taken that from, she says, if I'm trying to understand my relationship to the colonisation of this continent, I can at least see that some of my ancestors were in the thick of the processes of dispossession and deculturation, that I am indelibly tied to that history. And much of what I've discovered applies not just to the individuals I have written about, but to many other people in, of the same generation and time. In that sense, specific ancestors can be emblematic. So that's the hope, to be able to make that point or to be able to illustrate, um, you know, the more general from the particular. Um, another issue that I am concerned about is I want to make sure that I don't slip into romanticising my ancestors. Um, and obviously one way to do this is tempering the kind of positive side of them to, with the negative, more negative, the colonising side of it. But the other thing for me uh, that I'm kind of pointing to here is that increasingly um, 
I'm aware that a lot of important things that are worth saying uh, cannot really be said in academic, rational prose. I think, you know, there's a reason why people write poems and novels and they can say, tell us a lot of really important things in those forms. Unfortunately, I'm not a poet or a novelist. Uh, I don't have those kinds of skills. But I'm kind of in interested in trying to write stories um, in ways that draw on some of the strengths of some of those other forms of writing, I guess, um, to to try to engage readers, I guess, and um, at, at other levels. I think to, to to change people, to shift people in the way they think, we need to be engaging with them in more than rational ways and emotional levels and so on. But the trick to do that without romanticising my ancestors, that is the trick that I'll keep grappling with as I get writing. Um, I'm also working through what my particular sociological or cultural studies view might look like and my, what it might offer compared to what an historian might do to tell this story. And I guess one thing that's maybe a difference is there's likely to be more theory uh, in anything I write. Um, I'm also interested in writing, uh, and I guess a lot of people are doing this kind of writing now, and maybe they're historians as well, but I, I just finished recently reading Edward Duval's book, The Here with the Amber Eyes. He's one of a number of people who are writing, are telling historical stories, in his case a family story, but also writing himself into it, and the process of researching the story and telling the story is written into it. So that kind of writing immediately connects the historical past with the present and with the person who's doing the writing. Um, that's another thing that might be different from a sort of standard historical approach, I guess. And one thing, finally, that I haven't thought about too much as yet, but there is the, the fact that my ancestors are not only my own ancestors. They're, um, they are the ancestors of many others as well. George Graham, I imagine, probably has thousands of descendants in New Zealand. Um, what about my relationships to these people um, when I write about our shared ancestor? Okay, so that's all I really have to say at the moment. I have got um, a slide here that's got my references on it, if you want to follow up any of those. And one more, which is just my where I took the, the drawing of the... Um, the map of the barracks plan. Um, but thanks very much. I'll be interested in any comments or suggestions you have. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, who would like to um, comment or ask a question? Someone in Auckland? No? Okay. Well, I would like to if nobody else would. The thing that, one of the things that I really noticed, Avril, because I've thought a lot about it, is the way you talked about love and pride and pleasure. And, and you talked about this project as a pleasurable one too, and the way that we feel sometimes love, pride and pleasure when we think about those who came before. And also there's the, the other of that, which you talked a bit about, that you didn't, I suppose... I mean, I guess the you know shame. Uh, you mentioned guilt, so there's a, there's a tension between those emotions, and I wondered um, how how you would think about that tension in terms of the work that you're doing and how much it would organise what it is you want to do, especially with Ahmed's comments about anxiety. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'd be better place to answer this question once I've done, finished the piece of writing I'm about to start on, because that's the very topic of that. Um, but, yes, I, that, I remember reading once, a long time ago, where, that, you know, we can't have, it was about Australia, you know, we can't have pride if we're not prepared to also take on national shame. So that one goes with the other, right? It's set up context anyway, you can't be proud of what your nation's achieved if you're not also ashamed. Um, so I am aware, I think that's, I don't, is there a question about it, Deb? I've forgotten the question. Well, it just seemed to be a kind of axis 
of, sort of love and pride and pleasure and then the others of that. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I was asking, that seems to be a kind of axis that is organising what you're doing. And um, you were talking about what a sociological or cultural studies approach might bring in, perhaps an exploration of the emotional aspects of it might be something that sociology and cultural studies can offer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and it's like, is it, it's, you know, we've got Margie in the room here who's written a very important book about affect, effect. Um, and before this seminar started, Margie and Rose were having a very interesting conversation about, <laughs> <laughs> about effect. They're probably both in a better position to talk about this than I am at the moment, but I, I and it told, also ties to the fact that I was saying what I was saying about the, the importance of emotional registers, I suppose, and engagement to to move people, right? Uh -huh. um, so I think you're absolutely right. That's all I can say right now. You're absolutely right that those things are um, that kind of tension or that not to even attention, that connect that connection between those things is, is important. But what we do with them. Mm. And what they motivate us to do, that is, yeah. Do, do you want to say something, Marty? Uh, perhaps it would be not about emotion, but I was just thinking, I was just reading something about remembering and forgetting, which I think is really interesting in the dynamic of sort of banal nationalism. You know, that our nationalism is made up of lots of forgettings and lots of different practices of remembering. And trying to of those two activities together it seems to be part of what you're you're trying to do. You're trying to do a retrieval and not forgetting, but also um, you know it's, 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 it's trying that kind of yeah. I don't, I don't, in terms of emotion, I think it's pretty intriguing to think what are the effective practices involved in. And that sort of narcissistic pleasure of one's ancestors in there. Yeah. The sleep thing, what are we doing when we're so excited? You know, what, what kind of identification is going on? Think about those sorts of things the important part of this sort of work as well. To take critical and all the provisors are critical as it like to the simple emotions which this same research triggers in it. Okay, so I don't that was a bit distorted. I don't know, did others hear? Did you hear, Maggie? Not really. It was pretty okay. hard to understand. Yeah, I'll I'll just try to really briefly summarise a couple of things that Maggie said. And Maggie, please jump in and correct me. One was the relationship between remembering and forgetting in a in a country in a community, and what is remembered and what is forgotten, and what happens when you, you know, you bring something forward that has been forgotten, and a lot of the work of anti-racism in this country has been around that kind of work. Um, the other thing that you mentioned really was um, being interested in what is that pleasure that we get and pride that we feel when we feel connected with ancestors and thinking about that critically. So not just counterposing it to shame, guilt or whatever, but actually what is it that makes us feel good? <laughs> in some way, in, co in connection with ancestors, even knowing that they exist, or, you know, and I think you use the word narcissistic, you could think of what is the nature of that kind of pleasure of, it's a kind of identity work, isn't it, that we get pleasure out of, well, why, why? what is that pleasure? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I think, interesting questions. Sherry, I'm not sure if you see me, Debs, can you see us when we wave? Yep. Yeah. I just I can. speak to that because I was it Paul Commenton's work that you're reading? Uh Michael Billing. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll have to get that off here then. Um, but one of the things thinking about when you were talking, Margie, is when I started to get into the, the family history stuff, for a while there I totally got immersed and, and it was very pleasurable. I'd be up to two o'clock in the morning on the sites and I said to um, a very good friend of mine. So I'm a bit worried. I've got I've gone off on a tangent and I'm just loving this family history thing. And she stopped me and she said, You've just got to rest in that. It's so important to know your papa. And I think that's something that is Pākehā, we often we we draw a line 
and I think we can several different answers here. There's pleasure in learning and developing uh, connections to our past, but then there's the there's the other emotion, which is you're talking about two different things of pleasure here. There's the other emotion that we need to work with in our writing to engage the reader, which is something which is quite different. So sort of, mm. you know, I'd just like to say thank you. I'm, I'm going to have to go now, but really appreciated that, Everett. It was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jenny. Bye, Jenny. Bye. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes. Any other questions or comments? I see Canterbury's disappeared. Okay, um, G4, Jessica, would you like to make any comments, either of you? Uh, I'll jump in before Jessica. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, hi, Avril. I was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about the um, series of programs that have been um, across Australia, New Zealand and North America, I don't know if they've been shown in England, that are sponsored by the multinational company that owns the Ancestry group of companies. Oh, yeah. And, and so I was just wondering about whether or not you had, in terms of thinking about the, the critical reception for um, academic history or family history work, whether you were going to take a, a, a little sort of sideways glance at the, the public work, the, the notion that there is already um, for audience formation for the advertisers, there's this work of celebrity that is then uncovering its papa. And so I had the situation where my father told me about Rebecca Gibney's um, uh, being brought back to uh, Taranaki to see where her great grandfather had been involved in one of the battles and how she was given, because of the film crew, she was given this incredibly um, deep, rich uh, Māori response. Uh, and so, of course, the cameras captured her crying in response to the, what, the depth of emotion that she felt from the Māori ancestors of her um, grand, great-grandfather's ancestors. So I'm just wondering if you can sort of uh, say whether or not you're aware of that and whether or not you're going to use that in any way, shape or form in what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know the particular theories you're talking about. I don't watch enough TV. But I really should, clearly. I know there's, there's programs out there called, you know, like, who are your ancestors or something, I don't know. Mm. Is that the one it is? Is that what it's called? Where do I, I come a, from, is it? Yeah, there's, I think there's two. There's some competing ones. Right, yeah. Um, and I haven't looked at them. But except I did see a couple of those PBS ads um, about famous people that I remember seeing um, some years back. Um, but it's a really good question and it's a really good point to look at how, and it'd be really great study, wouldn't it, in itself to look at, I guess. It would. People are probably doing it, I guess, already, but um, looking at how they construct those connections in those programs. And it's interesting what the example you gave about Rebecca Dimney and then what what is the, what's the, what's the point of that emotion and that, you know, what is the purpose and how does that get wrapped into the narrative of the program and what a vicarious how does it end the yeah. audience? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I guess the other thing though that's reminding me of though is is a kind of a affirmation for the idea that there is an audience for family history, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yes. um, just looking at the time, Jessica, do you want to jump in for a minute or two before we finish? Um, uh, maybe just very briefly. Um, thanks, Avril. That was um, that was really interesting, uh, and I think you raised like some really good uh, questions around how to do this research and and the challenges and criticisms associated with it especially i think in terms of reaching people or you know having that kind of educative project i was sort of pondering as i was sitting here and the lights went out around me um the the people i talked to uh in my project and and some of them talked about their ancestors and there was always that element of um 
people either talking very positively, something's happening here, about their ancestors or having that question of how much were my ancestors involved in colonization and I think that's maybe one of the tricky things of you know that um, realizing that we all benefit from from satellite colonization whether our ancestors were uh, directly involved you know in it in a very particular way or not and how to, how to bring that across I think yeah that's right More comment that's <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And I think um, obviously you're only telling the stories. You do, you're only telling particular people's stories. And mm -hmm. but I am, I do. I guess that's where the play stuff can really helpful as a link to linking us now to them then. Um, just to occupy the same places. And even if if you read about, you know, you read a historical story that. Is, Napier or whatever else about, you know, that uh, that we Peter Wells talks about Colenso. So if I go down there and I think, you know, I would I would visit that place with a slightly different kind of feel. Or if I live there, I might feel a bit differently about it, but add dimension to my kind of feeling about the place because I've, I've read that, even though Colenso is not my ancestors or whatever. So you, you know there's and I think mm. I think if I was that's one of the things too that I would think that question of what I might do sociologically or as a cultural studies person. It's different from what a story in my I mean, there's lots of people writing these days where the, the present and the past are kind of connected together in the writing. So I've just finished reading Edward de Waal's book here with the Amber Eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's talking about his family, but also he talks about himself searching for the family. So that if the, in the writing, the past and the present are connected. Um, and I, a lot of people do mm -hmm. example. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the, another technique. I think the most yeah. Thank you, mm. <coughs> Sorry. So I think we need to stop. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Avril. And I've certainly got some further questions I'd like to talk with you about, and, and others might also, given that our time was short. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks very much. Cheers.